Uh, on Sunday, the 19th of April, I appeared on the K24 television show, Punchline, via a pre-recorded Skype interview. When I watched the show the following day, I noted that Anki Guta made a nine-minute lecture after my interview. It is then that I realized that there was some mischief. This is how it was planned. On Friday, April 17th, I came across a missed call from a number I did not recognize. Shortly, this was followed by a text message from Professor Mutahinguni, who introduced himself and requested me to appear on Punchline, a show hosted by Ms. Anne Kiguta on K24 television. I agreed to honor the invitation, given that the show suggested a topic was topical and I thought worth my time. It has since become clear that this was a ploy to anchor a desperate, contradictory, misinformed and ill-advised message grafted by Nguni at the behest of his masters with Anki Guta providing a voice. The manner in which my participation was exploited without my notice or consent in this unethical and lowly charade has constrained me to offer this rejoinder in order to clear the misunderstandings and provide the context. The authors of Kiguta's recital struggled heavily to emphasize the fact that His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta is the president. Time and again, the refrain that there is only one number one, there can only be one head of state, not two, one president at a time, that the boss is the boss, dominated her entire piece. I do not know who just discovered this seemingly exciting fact or who they think needs to be told because as far as all Kenyans are concerned, Uhuru Kenyatta has been president for eight years now. No one is more aware of this fact than the apparent target of this recital. That is the, de the Kenyatta's deputy, Honorable William Ruto. This is the one politician who has actively supported Kenyatta's presidential ambitions at great cost over a period of 20 years, three elections and one electoral defeat. Why then would someone in their right senses go to town with this declaration as though it was breaking news? Secondly, this narration through Kiguta on behalf of whoever stated that President Kenyatta has ditched his deputy, Kiguta went on to say that there was a covenant that the president, for his own reasons and in his own wisdom, has resolved to break the covenant. She kept on saying, the covenant is broken. It is important to recognize that it is broken, Kiguta said. Kiguta stated that President Kenyatta has chosen a new political ally in Raila Odinga and perhaps politically, according to him, the DP could only have gotten him so far. Kiguta went on to say, and I quote, governing for the last term required another alliance or perhaps for some reason the deputy has lost the president's confidence. Kiguta went on to emphasize that President Kenyatta has decided against his deputy. President Kenyatta is out of the marriage or the covenant, and it is, appears that it is for good. The effort invested to make this superfluous point is ridiculous. Only a fool doesn't know all this. In fact, no one, no, no one knows this fact better than Jubilee's 8 million members. We know it because there has been no party meeting at any level or any time this term. No parliamentary group meeting, no national executive council meeting, and no national govern governing council meeting. But the irrelevance of this strenuous assertion is borne out of by plain facts. When Kenyatta came together with Ruto to contest the 2013 election, they had an agreement the agreement was for Ruto to support Kenyatta in his bid to win the presidential election and Ruto agreed to support Kenyatta unconditionally. There was no reciprocal agreement or commitment for Kenyatta to support Ruto in the future. Afterwards, Kenyatta without any prodding, without any pressure or coercion, proceeded to enter a covenant with Jubilee supporters before Kenyans where he undertook to serve for a full term, and thereafter support Ruto to serve a su subsequent term. His emphatic and repeated declaration in his own words, kumi yangu, kumi ya Ruto. This covenant was publicly confessed on numerous occasions. There is no instant 
recorded, documented, or even merely remembered when Ruto mentioned or alluded to an arrangement of this nature, which remained purely a matter of Kenyatta's unilateral covenant. It is also was the basis of the subsequent proclamations of a 20-year jubilee leadership and a post-2032 message. The Kiguta and Gunyi script suggests that Ruto still conducts himself as though he is totally unaware that he has been shortchanged. He is aware, he is acutely aware, and so are we all, only that he is a gentleman and as such has refused to conform to the desires and expectations of the Kiguta masters who have labored strenuously to provoke and force him to behave in a certain way. After all, that has happened. These brokers and busybodies are, are, are the ones left, announcing to the world that no, mini no minister speaks to Ruto, that the security services ignore him, and that he has been evicted from his official residence in Mombasa. They go on to say that his cabinet roles have been transferred to a minister through an executive order. The same busybodies say that even during national crisis, mourning or emergencies, meetings of the National Security Council, where he is constitutionally mandated to attend, are held without him. After flooding the media with all these attacks, ridicule and innuendo, one would have to be monumentally naive to imagine that Ruto is unaware of his betrayal. A man who has kept Kenyatta's presidential ambitions alive for two decades, and who in his own right, is a phenomenally successful politician. Surely, he cannot have any difficulty interpreting these simple clues. A key justification for all this mistreatment meant to Ruto is that he started to campaign for 2022 early. Even assuming that this is, the, is a crime, what about the impunity and, the, and becoming shenanigans at the Jubilee Party? What about Kieleweke? In fact, the 2022 campaign was started by a senior party official, David Murade, who began to roll out the Stop Ruta campaign to complement Kileweke. This was before coalescing with ODM to build the BBI anti ruto campaign on a balance of probabilities. Has Ruto really sinned or has he been sinned against? Kigut and Gunyi suggested that Ruto ought to embrace the example of David, of scripture, saying, and in his predecessor King Saul made life hell for David. But because leadership was his, David became king in spite of and not by fighting Saul. This analogy is deeply disturbing because if it suggests that Ruto is David, who is staying where he is clearly not wanted and facing humiliation, then the authors of the script mean Kenyatta must be Saul. Now Saul was anointed to be king of Israel. But after reneging on a covenant, he fell out of God's favor. As a result, Saul devolved into a spiteful, vindictive, embittered, and, and blindly benevolent character who did all he could, not just to thwart David, but to murder him. It must be remembered that although David had multiple opportunities to harm Saul, he always rejected them opting instead to patiently endure whatever soul mentored out. Why would Kiguta liken the president to this tragic biblical figure? When did President Uhuru become King Saul? Kiguta and Gunyi have insulted the president. This is simply bizarre. Kiguta and Gunyi also strongly maintain that humiliation and persecution of uh, Ruto is similar to what President Moy underwent as Vice President to Mzejo Kenyatta. Why is it necessary or important for a president to harass, humiliate, frustrate he, and his deputy? What sort of leadership seeks gratification from this malicious behavior? And since when did it become the standard operating procedure of government? If Kiguta and Gunyi say that Kenyatta deliberately broke a covenant he unilaterally and voluntarily entered, why does he require brokers and busybodies like Murade and Francis Atuoli to propagate the breach. Kiguta and Gunyi go on to say that whether Kenyatta's actions are right or wrong, moral or not, is relevant because it is all politics and politics is a game. Uhuru Kenyatta is the president of Kenya. The caliber of a leader is measured by the extent to which their word is their bond. 
if Kiguta and Gunyi are suggesting Kenyatta conned Jubilee supporters and that he actually should change his deputy, are they saying also that it is acceptable for the president of Kenya to be deceitful and immoral? Kenyatta and Ruto got together to to got together to rid Kenya of the politics of deceit, conmanship, fraud and ethnic nationalism and, and betrayal. If according to Kiguta, this is normal, does it mean that deceit, fraud and betrayal are Kenyatta's governing principles, really? What does that pretend for the Jubilee Manifesto, commitments and other covenants that he makes, including his pet project, the Handshake, BBI and his new friend Raila Odinga? Finally, Kiguta and Gunyi exert themselves at great length to say that the Jubilee Party was not a formal institution, but a function of the personalities of Kenyatta and Ruto. They further state that without Kenyatta, Jubilee is dead. Yet Kenyatta himself was clear that the party must transcend individuals and exist for future generations. The configuration of Jubilee is deliberately against individualism, or disguised ethnic nationalism. This is why it, was, it transformed itself into a national party guided by set ideals and values. The idea that the president can casually trample a party constitution he participated in writing is problematic as far as respect for the institution goes. If the president can violate a party constitution, how do we expect him to respect the constitution of Kenya? Gunya and Kiguta also told us that the president is going to form a new grand coalition with opposition leaders. What business then does a retiring president have in forming ragtag coalitions with the opposition and political brokers?